We are inside the GSN newsroom with Jamil Sater, the CEO of Monumental Minerals, which trades on the Venture Exchange under the symbol MNRL. Welcome, Jamil. Well, thanks for having me on today, Guy. Really appreciate being here. My pleasure. Jamil, can you start out giving me a bird's eye view of Monumental Minerals? What assets do you own? What are your business objectives? Absolutely. So we have two assets right now. We have, uh, first and foremost, a uh, heavy rare earth project, and that is uh, located in northern Mexico in the state of Coahuila. It's actually about uh, 40 kilometers south of the, of the Texas border. Um, and this project, it's, uh, it's early stage um, exploration. And uh, we, uh, we're looking to develop this farther. We're looking to drill it uh, later this year. Um, and uh, we, we, um, we expect to get some, uh, some very good results from it. The second project that we have is, uh, is called Laguna Blanca. Uh, and this is a lithium brine and cesium lithium sediment project. It's in the lithium triangle in, uh, in Chile. So it's, it's quite high altitude, it's about 4,500 meters. And it's located about 80 kilometers east of the community of San Pedro de Atacama. With the explosion of electric vehicle sales, I think investor interest will rightfully go to the Chile lithium brine project. But because you've recently had news, today I want to talk to you mostly about the Mexico rare earth project. So can we start, let's pull back a bit. What are rare earths? Why are they important? Why are they part of the energy transformation story? So rare earths, they, they are actually part of, as you said, they're part of that energy transformation. And they kind of go hand in hand with the, uh, the lithium. Um, as we've seen over the past year, year and a half, the spot price for both rare earths and lithium has, has increased by, um, by several times. Um, between, yes. depending on what, what metal it is, between uh, two and five times mm -hmm. or more. Um, but, but the rare earths themselves, they're a group of, of elements that about 17 elements, four in particular, neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, and terbium, that are really key. Uh, these are key for, for that energy transformation because they're all required for magnets, for high-performance magnets for EV motors. Um, so in your, um, your Audi or your new BMW or Tesla or whatever it may be, um, these, these uh, metals will be in those magnets. Um, and then the, another key aspect of them is that they represent 94% of the rare earth market by value. So if you don't have any of these in your, your project or your deposit, um, it's very difficult to make a, an mm. economic case for it. And mm. the, the Jemmy project that we have contains all four and especially um, appreciable and economic concentrations in the samples we've collected so far of mm -hmm. the heavy rare earths. What is the difference in industrial application between heavy rare earths and light rare earths? I was going to say, what's the difference? I was afraid you'd say one's heavier than the other. So I rephrased it. Well, technically, it's they are they are heavier on the periodic table, but um, the real uh, the real differences between them is that uh, virtually all magnets that go into to motors, whether the, these are EV motors, these are the little little motors in your cell phone, so that it vibrates when it when it rings. Um, they all have neodymium and praseodymium. When you add in the heavy rare earths, when you add in terbium or dysprosium. Um, you can increase the operating temperature. I understand that the American government has declared, I believe, 17 REEs to be critical minerals. For investors, regulatory background is something they always need to pay attention to and often don't. And so to have, you know, it's one thing for Elon Musk to have to wait a month to, for him to have a, a, a bottleneck exactly. in his battery chain. It's another thing to say, oh, we can't complete these jet fighters because we don't have enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so right now, the U.S. imports 80% of their rare earth requirements from China. Yeah. Um, and they want to change that. It's not just the EV space, but I think yeah. that the U.S. federal government sees this as, um, as, as extremely strategic. 
that, that there is a, um, a friendly source. May 3rd, 2022, you released um, results from an airborne survey on the GEMI Rare Earth Project. Can you tell me about that? What did you learn about your project? What we were able to, to really determine is that from what we had sampled so far and from what we'd collected, we've been able to extend that area of interest from a very small postage stamp uh, to an area approximately 10 times that, uh, that size. Uh, we were on the, on the ground about a week and a half ago. I was there for a site visit um, and we were able to correlate very nicely the, uh, what we are seeing from the, the airborne uh, radiometrics and what we were seeing on the ground. So it, it, was, uh, uh, it really increases our confidence of where we need to go. Increasing your potential area of mineralization by a thousand percent for a survey, good start. What's next? What, what, what's next in your exploration plan for Jemmy? So first, we, we want to, um, to mobilize a field crew. Uh, we want to have this done as soon as possible and hopefully by next month having a group out there to do more mapping. We realized that, that um, airborne radiometrics works really well. Um, we're going to do it on the ground now. So we're going to take that, let's say that eight square kilometer area and we're going to, uh, to walk it. So walk it back and forth, back and forth to map out better um, with, with even more detail where we need to go. Before we spend uh, a lot of money on mobilizing drills and bringing drills out, we want to make very sure that we're, um, we're spending that money most effectively. What would it cost to run a phase one drill program on Jemmy? So at this point, we're estimating that we're going to drill about 2,500 meters this year. Um, the all-in cost, so that's not just the cost for the drill and the drillers, but this is also the cost for personnel, for yeah. the camp, for transportation, uh, everything, is about $350 per meter. So mm -hmm. we're looking at approximately uh, getting close to about a million million dollars for this year that we plan to spend. What kind of community relations issues or what, what I, I haven't been to that part of Mexico. What, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Who's there? There's not a lot of people in this, this part of, of Mexico. Um, yeah. It's ranching and mining country. As of now, we have very, very good relations with the, the local communities. Um, and our, our uh, one of the vendor of the project is um, he also has a ranch nearby, so he uh, he does understand the local community. He has a very good relationship with them. We do our best to um, to make sure there's a benefit for the local the local groups yeah. and the local communities, and and that's yeah. hiring these groups, these communities, or these ranchers. Um, to help us out as much as possible, whether it's clearing roads, whether it's building drill pads, um, whether it's hiring field assistants to help us help us in the field. Um, I think that's very important to make sure that, that, our, that people understand that, um, that there's, uh, there's economic benefit from us being there. Jamil, next time we talk, I want to talk about the Chile Lithium Brine Project. Thank you very much for your time today. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Well, thank you very much, Guy. Really, uh, really appreciate the time today. Likewise.